last spring, I was going to a Jesuit college uh, in upstate New York to give a lecture on my most recent book. It was about the science of stress and how to become resilient. And I went to the school, you know, I did my best to give a talk that would be of use to the audience, which was a mix of college students and faculty and community members. And I thought that it had gone pretty well, and I really enjoyed afterwards, I got to talk to a number of the students who were dealing with really serious issues and how the ideas connected to their experience. And then I came home, and the next day I had an email from someone who had been at the event. And he identified himself as you know, an older member of the community who had come to the event thinking he was going to hear an inspiring talk about how to deal with stress. And instead, he got this really uh, you know, boring and useless talk that had all the science in it. And he actually said the, the following things. Do you really think that anything you said at that talk helped anyone in the room? <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> uh, and he also said, don't you know that people are suffering? Do you think that if there was a young person in the room who was thinking about killing himself, that anything you said would have been of any help? It wouldn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the email said some other stuff too, but that, I think I was at that part, I was like <gasps> <laughs> And the reason, I mean, so you might think that that's bad, but it was worse than uh, even just like getting that sort of email because what you don't know about me is that before I give any talk, I think about the suffering that might be in the room. And I always think like, I just sort of have like a prototype. Like there might be someone here today who is going through a divorce or lost a child. And in that particular evening, one thing that was really on my mind was an event that had strongly impacted my career as a teacher and a researcher. And it was that my first uh, quarter teaching at Stanford, I was teaching Introduction to Psychology, which a lot of freshmen take. And there was a student who took an incomplete in the course. He didn't do well on the first exams. He couldn't finish his assignments. We granted him an incomplete. And then when I got back from winter break, I got an email from a, a resident, Saul Dean, that my student had killed himself over winter break. He actually had set himself on fire in his parents' home the day after Christmas. And he had been the valedictorian of his graduating class but he had not done well in his first quarter at Stanford. And that was hard, right? It was hard for many reasons. Obviously, it wasn't as hard for me as it was for his family. But there was part of me who thought, you know, my job is to not let that happen, to have some kind of a relationship with students where if that's their experience, that they have some kind of wisdom, perspective, self-compassion, that it's possible to go on and get through that. And it really became sort of part of my guiding mission as a teacher. I'm always thinking about that person in the room who's suffering so much and has that voice that says, I can't do this, what's wrong with me, what's the point? Because we know where that voice goes, where that voice often goes is, why don't you just kill yourself? So in this talk in, uh, in the Jesuit college, I had thought about him, that student, before I went on stage. And to get that email afterwards from that guy who was like, there probably was someone in the room who thought that way. And there's nothing that you said that would have been of any value to that person. So that was like my private moment of shame. And uh, a lot of the things that we'll talk about today are, are tools that I have to use when I get that sort of. It's interesting. One of the things I have to say, not to be like a little bit woo-woo about this, but um, we were ha talking woo-woo earlier, because I'm a scientist, but I'm a little woo-woo too, <laughs> <laughs> is something that one of my teachers said to me that was really interesting early on in this work around self-acceptance and self-compassion. She said, it, it was happening in response to the fact that um, I was experiencing a lot less self-hate in everyday life, but I started to have dreams in which they was like shame dreams or like self-criticism dreams. And she said, you know, when you bring a lot of mindfulness and compassion to your thoughts in everyday life, when you have that kind of awareness practice, that voice will find a way in. Right? <laughs> it's going to when you're not paying attention. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. And now I feel like, now that I'm not having shame dreams anymore, the universe is finding a way to make sure that that voice comes in <laughs> through emails. I get a lot of emails. <laughs> and it's amazing how much they sound like the voice in my head.